Well, I would invite you as we continue our worship by focusing our minds on the Word of God to turn with me to John chapter 3 for this message, the second message entitled, You Must Be Born Again. We return to this morning to John chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, where we see that Jesus reveals what must happen for a person to believe. We saw in John chapter 2 that the disciples had childlike but genuine faith, and the crowds had a superficial faith. The Sadducees before them had a Well, no faith at all. They rejected Christ. And so we can ask the question, why do some reject? Why do some believe and persevere? And why do some people believe in Christ and then fall away? And the short answer to that is it's because the Spirit must produce life in order for faith to be real. That's what we read here in this section of God's Word. Follow along as I read John chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Let's pray before we begin. Our Father, with this text open before us, we submit our hearts and our minds to what the Spirit would teach us today. We ask that you would open our minds and illumine our hearts, that you would show us Christ today. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Give sight to blind eyes, hearing to deaf ears, and life to dead souls. We believe, Holy Spirit, that only you can save and sanctify. And we ask that you would do that this morning for the glory of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is only good news if you know the bad news that we are sinners by nature and by choice, and as a result of our sin, we deserve the wrath, the just wrath, from a holy God. We have violated the perfect law of God, and we sit under its condemnation. In the same way that everyone knows that they have broken the laws of men, be it traffic laws or fudging on their taxes or shoplifting or some other offense, and yet very few people see themselves as deserving of the justice of the government, so it is with God. Everyone knows they aren't perfect. Everyone knows that they don't live up to the standard that God requires. But no one thinks they've done enough to deserve the wrath of God. 
more than that, most people think that they've been sufficiently good for God to give them a pass and let them into heaven. Well, to even come to that conclusion, to evaluate yourself in that way and evaluate God in that way, one has to believe that you can see and that you can know truth, truth about God. That conclusion, in other words, assumes that one knows enough about God to be able to assess what God evaluates about our lives. But that is a false assessment of our abilities. We, we tend to think too highly of ourselves and our ability to know transcendent truth. If we are alive, and of course, if we're thinking, then we are alive, we assume that that life grants us insight into spiritual things. But we don't know how dead we really are. We might be able to see with our eyes, but we don't realize how blind our hearts really are. We might be able to understand all kinds of things in this world, but we don't realize how dead to understanding our minds are to knowing the things of God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world, referring to Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. When you and I speak the gospel to unbelievers, we will generally receive or experience one of two responses. One is outright rejection, and another is some measure of faith response, even if it's just a slight interest. And we could ask ourselves, why would anyone in their right mind reject the greatest news in the world? The the news that delivers them from sin and hell and reconciles them to God. Well, the reason is this. In their blindness, they think they know better than God. Thinking they can see, they assess their lives differently than God does. They believe God to be different than He reveals Himself to be. They embrace a different solution for their problems of life. That is the universal explanation as to why anyone would reject Jesus Christ. And that's why in this passage, Jesus teaches that to have eternal life, one must be born again. You must have those blinders removed and truly see oneself accurately to know God truly. In order for that to happen, God must do this fundamental work of transformation in our, in our soul, and only then will we believe in Jesus. And so through this conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus teaches three requirements for eternal life, three requirements to have eternal life. First, as we saw last time, you must be born again. You must be born again. Secondly, you must be born of God. You must be born of God. And third, you must believe in Jesus. You must believe in Jesus. We covered the first and part of the second last time. And so we'll pick pick up where we left off after we kind of get a running start to get back into the flow of these truths. Every encounter with Jesus that the Apostle John gives us in this gospel has the purpose of demonstrating to us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the necessary response to that knowledge is to believe in Him and thereby have life in His name. John explicitly states this in chapter 20, verses 30 to 31, where he gives the purpose of this gospel. And so here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the Apostle John introduces us to different groups of people and their responses to Jesus. We saw in chapter 2, verses 13 to 21, that uh, the Sadducees, who were the keepers of the temple, rejected Jesus. They mocked and scoffed at His revelation of Himself. And then in verse 22 of that chapter, the disciples exhibited childlike faith. And then verses 23 to 25, we're introduced to the crowds, the the population of Israel, and how they had shallow faith. And now, John introduces us to Nicodemus, the Pharisee. He is a a leader among the Jews who, unlike the Pharisees, or rather, unlike the Sadducees, actually claims to believe the Bible, what we would consider the Old Testament. 
like the Apostle Paul, before Jesus saved him, the, the Pharisees, of which Nicodemus was, one, they were known for their pride and their self-righteousness. They were fastidious law keepers, and they believed that following the many man-made laws that they uh, put around the, the law of God as buffers, that they, by keeping those laws, they could make themselves acceptable to God. And if they could make themselves acceptable to God, then that would mean for them that they were better than everybody else who couldn't keep all of those laws. Now, there were always exceptions to stereotypes, of course, and perhaps Nicodemus was one of those exceptions. For one thing, Nicodemus does what no other Pharisee does, to our knowledge. He comes to seek private audience with Jesus without any malicious intent. He also comes at night, the only time that he could get one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus to have a, a conversation without raising too many questions among the people. In fact, his, his genuine interest in talking to Jesus is shown by how this conversation progresses. If you pay attention just in, in the various Gospels at how Jesus interacts with his antagonistic uh, religious leaders in, in Israel, the conversations usually are short because Jesus cuts off their desire to trap him in whatever uh, they want him to say. Or if the conversations are longer, you see Jesus become more and more obscure as the conversation continues because of their hardness of heart. Jesus wants to put on display that they don't actually believe. They're not willing to listen. What you see time and time again in the Gospels is that Jesus never reveals more truth to a hard heart. In this conversation, though, Jesus effectively begins with a confrontational statement in response to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, for his part, responds neither by unre uh, unbelief or by scoffing. As we read there, it become, becomes obvious what he does is he expresses confusion. And in response to that confusion, Jesus brings more and more light to the conversation. And it's in the successive revealing of truth that we find these three requirements for eternal life in verses 1 to 15. Now, beyond those three requirements, Jesus reveals even more truth in the next section, which we'll cover in the coming weeks. But let's look at verse 2 to see how this conversation begins. This man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Here Nicodemus reflects the general opinion of the population. He's not speaking on behalf of the Pharisees, not speaking on behalf of the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of, of Israel. He's speaking really, he's airing what the general population conclusion is, at least at this early stage, and he seems to agree with it by including himself in that statement. That'll be important when we come down to verses 11 and 12, so just keep that note in your mind. But he, he makes this statement of who he believes Jesus is with confidence. We know, he says, but he's wrong. They think Jesus is a teacher come from God, but that is fundamentally wrong. But as Jesus does, he doesn't respond to Nicodemus and correct what he says. Rather, Jesus responds to the heart of in Nicodemus that gave rise to what he said. He wants Nicodemus, rather, he wants to correct Nicodemus's core belief that he can perceive spiritual truth. So what he does is he effectively tells Nicodemus that he can't rightly know who Jesus is because he hasn't been born again. That's the first requirement for eternal life. You must be born again. Look at what Jesus said in verse 3. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Being born, born again, as we've seen, is, is to have access to God's kingdom, which is a spiritual king, kingdom now on this earth and an everlasting kingdom on the new earth. To see the kingdom of God is to know God, to be reconciled to God, to have your life enriched by all the spiritual blessings that God provides to, to see the kingdom of God is to have the love and joy and peace that surpasses understanding, which can only come from God. It's to have hope in trials. It's to have forgiveness in failure. 
This is eternal life. It is knowing God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And so to access this life now and forever, you must be born again. We need to be born again because though we are alive in the body, we are dead to God. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says, And and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying about the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. In other words, to be spiritually dead is to be cut off from the life of God. And when you're cut off from the life of God, all you're left with is living out of your own flesh, out of your own desires, out of your own sinful impulses, which leads to spiritual, eternal death. But then Paul says there in Ephesians 2, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. That's the new birth. Being born again means to be given spiritual life from God. To be born again is to be reconciled to God and receive adoption into His family and citizenship in His kingdom. Our problem as human beings when we're born into this world is is not that we live the wrong way, it's not that we think the wrong way, but that we are dead in sin and incapable of doing anything to earn eternal life. So what's the solution to that problem? How can you be saved from such a condition? You must be born again. You must be born again. Like Nicodemus, people might be able to observe something unique about Jesus. We know that in this world, people say, oh, he's a good teacher, he's a a faithful prophet of God. People might be able to make observations, but they cannot see spiritual truth for what it is. Why? Because in order to see and hear and understand, you must be born again. You must be granted life whereby your, your eyes and your ears and your heart are granted capacities that they don't naturally have. Well, understanding that Jesus is teaching that something radical needs to change, but assuming that he has the ability to do it himself, Nicodemus responds this way in verse 4. He says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus has lived his whole life, not just personally, but propagating a system of human accomplishment. He has presumed from the earliest age that he could make himself right with God. But the truth is, in our deadness, we cannot do that. We cannot make ourselves right with God. It's only something that God can do. And so Jesus corrects his error by revealing the second requirement of eternal life. Not only must you be born again, but you must be born of God. That birth must be accomplished by God. Look at verses 5 to 10. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? The new birth, Jesus says here, is brought about by the Spirit of God. So to be born again is to be born of the Spirit. Just as, I, as you and I contributed nothing to our natural birth, neither can we contribute anything to our spiritual birth. And so to avoid confusion about this, Jesus expresses the divine work of salvation in three days. He, he communicates here that the work of salvation is the new covenant, is the fulfillment of the new covenant. He also says that it is a spiritual birth, and he also concludes that it is imperceivable to the physical 
senses. Look again at verse 5. Jesus says there, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So to answer the question, how does the new birth take, take place? Jesus says, you must be born of water and the Spirit. Now remember that Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. He's speaking to a Pharisee. Not just any Pharisee, but one who is part of the Sanhedrin. And as he calls him later, the teacher or at least a teacher of Israel. In other words, Nicodemus is a biblical scholar, if there was one. Nicodemus should immediately recognize that water and spirit is a reference to the new covenant found in Ezekiel 36. The new covenant is where the Lord promises to to wash his people of their uh, sin with water, reflecting the forgiveness of sin. He promises to give them a new heart, and he promises to put his spirit within them. That's the new covenant of which we participate when we believe in Christ and are given new life. So the new covenant is the promise by God in the Old Testament of how he would redeem his people. It's how he would bring an end to that endless cycle of rebellion and repentance and rebellion and repentance and rebellion. When God saves, he washes away our sin, he grants us a new heart, and he implants his spirit within us. That's what it means to be born again. And it's only by being born of water and the Spirit that we can see and enter the kingdom of God. When God accomplishes the new birth in a person's life, it's the fulfillment of the new covenant, which means that it is solely a work of God. Well, that brings us to where we left off last time. And so then we continue to see how Jesus further declares that the new birth is a work of God by asserting that it is a spiritual birth. It's a spiritual birth. Look again at verse 6. And Jesus says there, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. This statement asserts the universal law that anything that produces, produces after its own kind. Dogs produce dogs. Whales produce whales. Humans produce humans. Despite theories that one kind can produce another kind, if you just give it a few million years, the universal law remains forever fixed. Every creature that produces, produces after its own kind. And so it is that that which is flesh, that is that's, that which is earthly, can only produce flesh. That which is flesh cannot produce spirit. The Spirit of God, though, because He is spirit, He can produce spiritual beings. If you think back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, where the Apostle Paul says that the natural man can't accept the things of God, in verse 15, he calls the one who has been born again a spiritual person. So when the Spirit grants new life, we go from being a, a natural person to a spiritual person. Or as Jesus puts it here, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. You cannot see the kingdom of God in your natural condition. You need to be made alive by the Spirit, Jesus says. And so he continues in verse 7, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. This is really a, a light rebuke to Nicodemus who should be getting this stuff. This is spirituality 101. And the elite theological mind of Nicodemus should be getting it by now, if if not even before this conversation. But then Jesus presses on, and he expresses that the new birth is a work of God and not man, not only by the fulfillment of the new covenant, not only because it's a spiritual birth, but also because it's imperceivable to the physical senses. It's imperceivable to the physical senses. Look at verse 8. Jesus says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This metaphor is so obvious, it hardly requires explanation. Wind, of course, is invisible to our eyes. All we can see and feel is the impact of the wind at any given moment. Wind, at least in our personal experience of it doesn't follow a predictable path. 
It doesn't move at a consistent speed. From our perception, it starts, it stops, it twists and turns. It is, to say the least, unpredictable, again, according to our perception. But it's not unpredictable because it's actually random. Rather, it's unpredictable because we can't perceive the forces at work that direct the wind. And so it is with the Spirit, Jesus says. If, if the new birth was something that we ourselves could accomplish, if, if it involved our participation, we could, to one degree or another, predict it. If being born was of human origin, being born again was of human origin, we could plan around it and strategize for it and create the right conditions to see it happen. Many churches do that or try. That's not how it works, though. We, we can't fix a day on which the new birth will take place. We can't manipulate the circumstances to see someone else be born again. The Spirit of God is sovereign over salvation, and we cannot predict when or how it will happen. Not because the new birth is random, but because we can't perceive the mind of God that determines when He will bring new life into a person's heart. So the new birth is a work of God by the Spirit according to His mysterious, sovereign will. That's what Jesus is saying there in verse 8. At best, we can see the effects of it. You know, sometimes a person can sense a clear difference in their soul from one moment to the next, maybe from one day to the next or one season to the next. Sometimes people experience a radical shift in their cravings the moment that they come to Christ. Still others feel a, a, a sense of empowerment to, to change their behavior that they didn't feel before. Sometimes a person doesn't feel anything at all. In fact, if you're the kind of person who doesn't know when you are saved because you never perceived a change in your own soul, think, think about this. Not a single one of us, I say this without fear of contradiction, not a single one of us remembers neither the hour or the day or the year that you were born. The only reason that you know when you were born is because when you were born, it was documented and your parents marked it and they told you year after year after year, much to your delight because you got presents. But think about that. If no one outside of yourself told you when you were born, you would never know how old you were. But you knew you'd, you were alive because you're alive. That's how it is for many people in the kingdom of God. Many of you only know you're born again because you know you have spiritual life. You believe in Christ and you love Christ. But you don't remember when that started. Now, others of you do remember there was a clear moment in your life from one moment to the next or, or one day to the next or some season like that. And, and that's fine too. To, to know when you were born again is in some ways a blessing, but can I say it's also a danger? Because when we think we know when we were born again, sometimes we rely on that experience for our confidence rather than relying on the finished work of Christ as the confidence we have of our salvation. Well, all of this is to say that when the Spirit moves, when He fulfills the new covenant promises, when He produces spiritual life in a person according to His sovereign will, you have been born of God. This is the second requirement for eternal life, that you must be born of God. Well, by this point, Nicodemus, still a natural man and not yet a spiritual man, is utterly perplexed. And so he says in verse 9, how can these things happen? be. He's not antagonistic. He's not mocking. He's not scoffing. He's just confused. How can this be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Nicodemus was one of the brightest theological minds in Israel. As a Pharisee, he was expected to know the scripture and he did. 
And as one of the Sanhedrin, he would be seen as one of the elite of the elite, the leaders of the leaders. Jesus says here, are you the teacher of Israel? That's not an official title or position that we can discern. Jesus seems to simply be highlighting that as a, as a Pharisee, as a member of the Sanhedrin, he would be seen as a teacher of the nation. And, and being the elite of the religious leaders, it was shocking that he could not understand spiritual truth. Of course, not shocking to Jesus. But perhaps to Nicodemus, he's surprised. Why can I not figure this out? Well, if we had time, I'd take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul is talking about how God designed salvation in a way to put to shame the elite of society. To put to shame the, the wise according to this world, the strong and the noble, as Paul puts it. In other words, the, the rich and the powerful and the educated assume that all knowledge is accessible to them. They're either smart enough or rich enough to figure anything out. But quoting the Old Testament there in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul writes, I, uh, speaking of the Lord, uh, rather the Lord speaking, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. And so Paul concludes that section by saying, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being can boast before God. The point of that is this, salvation is a gift of God, and neither wisdom, nor wealth, nor intelligence, nor power, or nobility gives anybody any advantage. In fact, those things actually make it harder to receive salvation because God purposes to shame those that the world elevates and so he largely chooses to redeem those whom the world ignores. And so, my friends, if you're looking to the elite in society to decide what you will believe, if you are influenced by what the majority thinks is right, then your trust is in the wrong place. That's not to say that the minority have a inherent corner on the truth, as critical theory would teach, but it is to say that the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, by its very nature, is a stumbling block and foolishness to the natural person, no matter what their position or power or intellect. Among all those in Israel, there's hardly no one we would think would be more capable of understanding spiritual truth that Jesus teaches than Nicodemus. We would assume that his scholarly expertise in, in the Scripture would coalesce around Jesus' words and make sense of it all, but, but it does not. And why does it not? Because he is not born again. Because he is not born of God. And because he can't understand it, he doesn't believe it. That leads to the third requirement for eternal life. The third requirement for eternal life is that you must believe in Jesus. You must believe in Jesus. Look at verses 11 to 15. Jesus continues, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless, or rather, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. My friends, to have eternal life, you must be born again of the Spirit, and you must believe in Jesus Nicodemus began this conversation by claiming that he knew who Jesus was, or at least rather what was true about Jesus. And Jesus responded by declaring that he couldn't know what was true about him because he wasn't born again. But the divine withholding of regeneration or the new birth does not negate the responsibility to believe. And so in these words, Jesus admonishes Nicodemus for not believing, while at the same time declaring that belief is required to have eternal life. Let's see how he does this. Look at, again, at verses 11 and 12. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Here again, he begins with this statement, truly, truly, I say to you, and this is a signal to us, remember, to slow down, to to consider carefully what Jesus is about to say. And and when we do that, when we slow down, we notice something peculiar about what Jesus is saying here. He doesn't say, I speak of what I know. He says, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. And then you might notice that your Bible has a footnote that every instance of the word you in verses 11 and 12 is plural. So when he says, you do not receive our testimony, and if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe and so on, those pronouns are plural. Well, if this is a one-on-one conversation, and it is, what's going on with these plural pronouns? We'll go back to verse 2, where Nicodemus started this conversation. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. However, unofficially, Nicodemus speaks here on behalf of the nation of Israel. And so, in verses 11 and 12, Jesus responds to Nicodemus as a representative of the unbelieving nation. And in contrast to Nicodemus and the unbelieving nation, Jesus aligns himself with all those who speak the truth and bear witness to God's revelation. That would certainly include John the Baptist, who has already publicly declared Jesus to be the Messiah. That would include the disciples who are beginning to tell others in their at least personal conversations about the things they're hearing Jesus teach and the things they're seeing Jesus do. And by extension, this would include all of those throughout the ages who have spoken God's truth and been rejected by the world. In short, when Jesus says we, he's referring to all of those who are part of God's kingdom, Christ himself as king and all those who've been born again. And we say we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen. Nicodemus said we know, but he didn't really know. But those who have been born again can say, we know, because God's truth has come and illumined our hearts. On the contrary, when he says, you, Jesus says, you cannot see, because they have not entered into God's kingdom. You, he says, do not receive our testimony. To receive a testimony means to believe it. And those who are born again do not receive the testimony of Jesus, and those who are not born again do not believe the truth of Jesus. And so again, he says in verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I told you heavenly things? Those terms earthly and heavenly simply refer to things that pertain to the earth and things that pertain to heaven. Paul used those words in 1 Corinthians 15, 40 to refer to our earthly bodies as compared to our glorified heavenly bodies. The truth about the need to be born again and born of God is an earthly thing because only earthly people need to be born again. Nobody in heaven needs to be born again. So Jesus is saying there in verse 12, if you can't understand divine truth about the things that pertain to life on earth, how will you understand and believe the truth about things that pertain to life in heaven. Now, why would he say this? Well, again, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And Pharisees, unlike the Sadducees, believed in life after death. And they had questions about life after death. If you've read through the Old Testament lately, particularly looking for what does the Old Testament say about life after death, you're probably going to be as disappointed as the Pharisees were. Uh, God didn't reveal very much in the Old Testament about life after death. And so the Pharisees had a whole lot of theories of what would happen, but they had no answers. So knowing the heart of Nicodemus, Jesus knew that he had questions in his mind, that he wanted to ask this man come from God, or rather this teacher come from God, as Nicodemus called him in verse 2. But Jesus tells him, we can't get to those heavenly things 
because you haven't yet understood and believed the basic earthly matters. Isn't it true that sometimes people want to know the more esoteric aspects of theology when they haven't yet believed the basics? It's fruitless to get into those other issues when a person fundamentally rejects Christ. Well, Jesus then turns the discussion to declare his own personal credentials to speak on earthly and heavenly truths and the need to believe on him. Look at verses 13 to 15. He says, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Here, Jesus declares himself to be the Son of Man. And that title, Son of Man, comes from the book of Daniel as a reference to the Messiah. And no one, Jesus says, no one has been to heaven except the Son of Man who came from heaven. In other words, apart from the Son of Man, no one on earth has been in heaven and therefore no one can reveal heavenly and earthly truth except for the Son of Man who has been in both heaven and on earth. That's important. A lot of people then and now make all kinds of claims about heaven and earth. Almost every religion asserts some claim about what happens when you die. And every religion, including atheism, has something to say about life on this earth, where it came from, how life should be lived, the standards for right and wrong. There's no shortage of people who want to tell you and bear witness to what they claim they know and they have seen. And sometimes we struggle because we're like, who am I supposed to believe? One religion will tell you you're part of the universal divine essence, and when you die, you just become a drop in the ocean of that divine essence. Another religion will tell you that when you die, there's multiple levels of heaven, and where you go depends on how you live in this life. Another religion will tell you that if you've been good enough, you will become the god of your own planet. And then some religions say that when you die, you just cease to exist. Who do you trust? Most people will tell you that if you just are sincere in your beliefs, in your beliefs you'll be fine. Some say there's no truth. Others say there is truth. Some say there's no standard of right and wrong. Some say there is a standard for right and wrong. Who are you to believe? I mean, imagine if we could assemble the, the greatest minds and leaders of religions and philosophy throughout the ages, Plato and Aristotle and Buddha and Jesus, Jesus and Muhammad and Joseph Smith and Mary Baker Eddy and Charles Darwin and Stephen Hawking and Neil Tyson and the Pope and whoever else you would want to add to that list. How do you decide who you're going to believe? Well, can I make a suggestion? It seems to me that it would be wise <laughs> to believe the person that came from heaven, lived on earth, died, rose again, and ascended back up to heaven. And didn't just do those things or, or say that he did those things, but that he did it with an extraordinary amount of eyewitnesses. Well, there's only one person in history that qualifies to speak on earthly and heavenly things. It is the Son of Man, Jesus the Christ. He didn't come to earth in some mysterious descent in a back alley and tell people, hey, here I am. No, he came through a miraculous birth that was preceded by another miraculous birth. And his birth was proclaimed to angels, or, or rather by angels, to a, a group of shepherds. And it was revealed to foreign dignitaries who came to honor him. His sinless and powerful life was witnessed by the whole nation of Israel. His death was observed by hundreds, if not thousands. And then his risen life was seen by hundreds. And then his ascension back up to heaven was observed by dozens. And those who witnessed his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension... They devoted their lives to proclaiming what they knew and what they had seen, even to the point of death. 
People die all the time for what they think they know. Nobody dies for what they know to be a lie. Jesus didn't just make religious claims. He proved in the sight of all that he could be trusted. He proved it by his miraculous birth. He proved it by his miraculous power. But there's no greater proof than his death and resurrection. Look at again at verses 14 to 15. He says, as Moses, was, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Here Jesus draws on Nicodemus' understanding of the Old Testament to illustrate the need for faith. Uh, Numbers 21 is where we find the account of Israel once again complaining to God about their perception that He's not caring for them. And in judgment, He sends poisonous serpents to go among them, and many are bitten, are poisoned, and die. And so in repentance, they cry out to the Lord, for mercy. And so the the scripture says, the Lord said to Moses, make a, a fiery serpent and set it up on a pole and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at this bronze serpent and live. The Lord didn't remove the serpents from the midst of Israel, but he did provide a cure for those who were bitten. They need only to look at the statue of that serpent that was set up on a pole, and they would be healed. It seems a bit odd, doesn't it? Why should looking at an object cause physical healing? How would, how would just where you direct your eyes cause the poison of a serpent to leave your body? It's certainly not science. It's not even a ritual. It's simply turning your head to look at a figurine. There's no power in the act. And beloved, that's exactly the point. What God provided was not a solution to the poison. He provided a solution to their unbelief. Looking to the serpent on the pole required faith. Faith sufficient to turn one's head and and look in the direction of the Lord's appointed solution. In short, to to be delivered from death in that moment and all the time, one simply needs to believe and obey the Word of God. In the same way, Jesus says, the Son of Man will be lifted up. Lifted up can mean to to be propped up off the earth. It can also mean to be propped up uh, figuratively as in being exalted. But by comparing the lifting up of the Son of Man to the serpent on a post, the clear intention is that he will be physically lifted up. And there's there's only one way that that happens. It's on a cross. And like the bronze serpent, Jesus will be set up on a post, as it were, and he will be propped up on the earth. Jesus will use the same language uh, two more times, but in chapter 12, just days before his crucifixion, he says this, verse 32 of John 12, and I, when I am lifted up on the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And then John comments, he said this to show by what kind of death he was to die. So why would he be lifted up? Well, Jesus tells us here in verse 15 that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. In verse 14, his purpose in stating that he will be lifted up is not so much to reveal the details of his death as it's articulated in chapter 12, but rather to emphasize and reveal the necessity of faith. Nicodemus and pretty much everybody in the world is trapped in a human, rather in a religion of human accomplishment. He believes that his relationship with God and his eternal destiny is based on his own ability to live up to a standard of rules and rituals and regulations. He believes that he has the capacity within himself to understand spiritual truth and the power to live rightly before God. In other words, he believes what 
every person born into this world believes, and that is what every false religion teaches, that we can accomplish our own salvation through our own intelligence and our own wisdom and will and strength. But he's wrong, and so is everyone who tries to make themselves right before God. According to God, who made us and knows us, He knows our heart and our thoughts, we are spiritually dead, as we've seen, and therefore incapable of climbing that dividing wall between us and God. We cannot escape the punishment and the just judgment that is due to us. Only an extraordinarily rare swimmer has the ability to swim across the English Channel. But no human can swim across the Atlantic Ocean, let alone the Pacific. And yet many people believe they have the power within themselves to to cross that vast chasm between them and God. As I often do, I asked a woman a few months ago, if you were to stand before the Lord and He were to ask you why He should let you into heaven, what would you say? And without hesitation, she responded by boasting about her goodness. And she's she wanted to help me to see just how good she was. And so she said, I even stop at a red stoplight at night when there's no other cars around. (laughs) My friend, if you can, if you think you can obey the traffic laws and give money to charity and serve the underprivileged and that will punch your ticket to heaven, you are gravely mistaken. If you think you can get God to give you a pass because of your attempts to be a good person, you will find yourself turned away and sent to hell with everyone else who is likewise likewise deceived. Because the only way to have eternal life is to recognize that due to your sin, you fully deserve hell and you are incapable of overcoming that judgment on your own. And, And then you look to Christ You have to turn your gaze away from yourself and and look to Christ, not just because God said so, but because Christ proved it. He lived His sinless, perfect life. He died a substitutionary death. And so we are to look to Him who was lifted up on a cross and received on Himself the wrath of God that was due to sinners like you and me. You need to believe that He and He alone is able to rescue you from hell and condemnation. Yes, God must do the work of regeneration. God must grant spiritual life to those who are dead in sin. And then being born again gives those who are spiritually cold to God warmth toward Him. It gives those who are spiritually deaf ears to hear. It gives those who are spiritually blind the ability to see Christ as the truth is revealed in Scripture. And then when one's heart is warm to God and the gospel is heard and the glory of Christ is perceived in the heart, that person must believe. How can they not believe in the glory of Jesus Christ? So my friends, you must be born again. You must be born of God and you must believe in Jesus. And when those things happen, you will have eternal life. Now, for those of us who have believed in Christ, who have been born again, who have eternal life, how does a passage like this help us today? Well, it should cause us to rejoice because for reason totally apart from ourselves, God has given us life. He's been merciful and gracious and compassionate toward us and He's saved us from our sin. So we should rejoice, but We should not stop there. We should be eager to tell those around us that they must be born again, that they must believe in Christ, that they can have eternal life if they would but look to Christ who gave himself for sinners. Let's pray. Our Father, as we reflect on these truths, our hearts are compelled to give praise and glory to you. Apart from anything you've done, we, we would be lost in sin and be destined to hell. 
But because of your love that we've been singing about today, your love has been poured out on us in Christ and made salvation possible. More than that, you purchased us by that blood of Christ and granted us eternal life. So cause us to rejoice and celebrate and live and proclaim this message to the world. And Lord, if there would be anyone here today who does not know Christ, who has not yet believed on him, would you grant them the the new birth? Would you help her to see Jesus Christ? Would you grant them life eternal and give them the gift of faith? We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.